you know, you force these legislations in that the public doesn't support, they'll push back. So we can't, even if we sign something into law today that, you know, you can't, all animal, all forms of animal use is illegal. It, like, it just wouldn't work. Hey fellow animal respecters, welcome to another video. For those of you who may have missed it, I recently did a live stream with Dan Shepard, who some of you may know from the TV series Veganville. We covered loads of crucial topics, everything from effective animal advocacy to navigating conflicting ideas within the movement. Be sure to watch till the end for some hilarious bloopers. A massive thank you to Dan for having me on his channel. If you haven't already, be sure to check him out at Grumpy Vegan Granddad and subscribe to his YouTube channel so that you can follow the inspiring animal advocacy work that he does. While you're over on Dan's channel, you may also want to watch our full chat so you can hear the context surrounding these points as this video will be a rapid fire highlight reel. With that, let's get into it. In the last five years, okay, since I've been vegan, I, I went vegan four and a half years ago and in those four and a half years I've seen things snowball enormously now what do you think's caused that do you think it's the culmination of everything that's gone before it or do you think something's happened to is is some sort of tact tactic or some sort of activism what's changed that all of a sudden what has sort of made this snowball suddenly happen because back in 2006, there were 150,000 vegans in the UK. Uh, in 2000, what, what were we on now, 21? In 2015, 16, I think there was 600,000. Um, so it's catapulted. They reckon there's 1.5 million in the UK now. Yeah, I think getting into studies well, real quickly my, my poorly timed laugh was in response to race lover not what you were saying but false jeremy if you eat vegans you won't get enough vitamin bs <laughs> 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 so um but yeah i mean i think with studies i know especially when i early days as an animal advocate i think and this this is a big mo movement question too is like how much should we focus on winning versus it being a marathon versus a sprint um, and I know early days I was like, right, let's do this. Let's, let's end the animal Holocaust. Let's, let's do it right now. Like I want to do everything I can just make freaking stop. I mean, I was reflecting the other day, like I'm 39, nearly 40 and I'm standing on a street with a laptop, just trying to get people to stop grounding up, you know, little, little people. Like it's, it's really just mind boggling actually. Um, but back to your earlier point, I mean, I think as far as moving on when people aren't, you know, if the disconnection is, is not salvageable, I think you said. I think until they see our fellow animals as individuals, which basically everyone's had an interaction with a dog or a cat or someone else, like I like to stay there. I like to live in that space with them and keep pulling them back to it. I mean, even even so-called hunters, I've had, you know, see, see them get quite emotional when they think about those times when it wasn't a quick, clean kill as if that even matters. And so I, th I think everybody has a, a, a compassionate angle to them and, and, and the, the possibility for respect. Um, you know, besides maybe the one to two percent that's you know clinically psychopathic or sociopathic. So I think for the most people, I like to live in that space as much as possible and keep that focus on, on the animals. What I find problematic for our activism is bringing politics into it. Now I've got a view on this, Jeremy, and yeah, let's my, go there. Well, my view on on politics is this, right? Um, you've got to bring politics into it somewhere along the line, right? Because mm. our goal at the moment is to get a percentage of the UK vegan, okay? That is that is the goal. Once we get to that percentage, then we've got influence on government. Then we can start making tracks towards stopping subsidies to farmers and to, towards mm. fishing, you know? And this knock-on effect, now that's how I see it, but at the moment... I think focus at the moment should be on on advocacy and and getting those numbers up. And I think I think it's moving in the right direction. And I'm, I think it's it's snowballing right now. Um, predictions are three point five million by the end of twenty twenty one. And, and just a quick pitch: anybody who's watching who um, isn't already following Catherine uh, Klein or Seb Alex, I ha I, I'm, a, I'm guessing you're familiar with both those channels. But yes. they they've both just done in, um, videos around individual versus system change, which are, are fantastic. Um, I highly recommend them. I, I think the big question is when. I think you hit the nail on the head. To me, when 99% of the population opposes us, 
you know, in one of Catherine's videos, she used the analogy of um, prohibition. You know, you force these legislations in that the public doesn't support, they'll push back. So we can't, even if we sign something into law today that, you know, you can't, all animal, all forms of animal use is illegal. It, like, it just wouldn't work. Like, you know, there, there's, there's certain, a there's certain percent has to support something before there's widespread adoption. And Roger can speak to this far better than me. I mean, I've seen figures everywhere from 10% to 25%, you know, and everything in between. To me, I think looking at those surveys and all that, and, you know, the growth rates and all this can be kind of disheartening sometimes too, because either they're not growing fast enough or they're unreliable. But to me, it's like our job's the same. We still have to do what we're doing regardless of the outcome. So I, I've tried to remove myself from the big picture in, in that sense and just really focus on what I can do. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, this brings me on to another thing as well. Um, and I know there's been lots of talk about, about the intersectional side of things. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to know how, how does that affect me? I don't understand how that affects me personally in my activism and what I am trying to do. Um, I'm just wondering if you've got an idea on that, whether it affects you or or whether anybody should really sort of uh, be thinking along these lines. Does it does it really work? Is it necessary? Is it will it help in any way? Yeah, I think it goes back to our conversation about focus versus scope. And I think regardless, you know, I think the I word has become quite polarizing. So I think of it just as human rights, which you know, uh, another topic is, you know, whether or not we take a rights-based approach or not. But if we talk about, you know, animal rights and someone says, you know, animals don't have rights, I think it's quite a good counter to say, well, do you think humans have rights um, and, and, and respond that in that way? And, and, and we're not centering humans when we do that, but we're using that knowledge to build the case for our fellow animals. So that's just one example. I could probably mm. list off about 20 of how we can use these peripheral issues to strengthen our case. And to me, that's what it's really about. If you haven't already, be sure to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so you can be <laughs> notified when the other clips are released. I also have some other upcoming videos I'm super excited to share with you. Thanks for watching, and let's keep evolving our language to build respect for our fellow animals, and I'll see you in the next video. Respect anybody of that. Oh, what if you broke? I wouldn't expect <laughs> it. So I'd just prefer to shut that door in the first place. Wow. Um, right. <laughs> there's a first time. There's a first time for everything, Roger. <laughs> for free resources such as a discussion guide and language document, check out veganinteractions.com. Thanks for watching.